Hi everyone, it's Raghu Marcus, and I'm here with uh, a new guest. Everybody out there, you haven't um, heard of him, maybe, and many of you have heard of him because his name is David Godman. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. And you know, David, uh, we were talking about. Uh, David has written many books and has lived in uh, Tiruvannamalai, which is the hometown of Ramana Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi, great, great saint who lived in India, who left his body in, in the 50s, David, early 50s? 1950. 1950. And um, he means a lot to us, those of us that were in India with Neem Karoli Baba and uh, Ram Das and we have a real affinity to him and his teachings, although this isn't a, an although, it's a as well. Uh, Ramana's teachings are Advait teachings, non-dual teachings, uh, but very much of the heart at the same time. Uh, and I have to say, David, for people who do not know uh, Ramana Maharshi, would you tell the story of his uh, transformation when he was 16 years old, living in a village in India? He was uh, a Brahmin boy, mostly uninterested in anything apart from the kind of things average teenagers would be interested in in those days. He played sports, hung out with his friends had little or no interest in any kind of religious activity. He did uh, have a very brief period of feeling great waves of uh, bhakti towards ancient Tamil saints who had lived about a thousand years ago. He'd read an anthology of their teachings. And for almost all of his life, he had felt an incredible reverence for Arunachala. He, he wrote a poem uh, saying that from an age before I even had any rational thought, before anyone gave me any, any information, the greatness of Arunachala shone in my awareness. It was there all the time, uh, not something anybody had told him. It just seemed to be one of his um, samskaras, it was there. So there were these strong pulls towards Arunachala and a minor interest in devotional activities of long dead Tamil saints, but there was no practice, there was no quest, there was no feeling that he had to do anything about any of this. And then when he was 16, he had a, a definitive transformation in which his individual self was completely eradicated over the space of a 20 minute experience, which started when he began to feel that he was about to die and in response to that, he simply watched the process happen inside himself and wondered forensically, if you like, what, what it was that was going to die and what would remain after death of the physical body. And in, in that process, he shifted the locus of his identity from a person who was inhabiting a body into the substratum, the consciousness, which he became aware of for the first time in which he understood to be permanent and abiding and unaffected by death. And when he got up off the floor, uh, he knew himself to be that consciousness. He'd severed completely his identification with the body of the boy. And for the rest of his life, he remained in that state. Hmm. And he, my uh, understanding was that he, he actually repeated or asked himself, who am I? And that became the principle. There, there, there were a few crucial elements to this. The only time he ever wrote about this experience, uh, he wrote a couple of lines that said, inquiring within, who is the one who sees? I saw that seer disappear, leaving that which is always there. No mm. thought arose to say, I saw. How then could the thought arise to say, I did not see? It's a little bit cryptic, mm. but if, if, if you want a before and after, he inquired into the nature of the observer inside himself, 
saw that it was a false entity and with that the whole dichotomy of seer and seen disappeared. There was no longer an internal I who saw anything outside of himself. There, there was simply the consciousness in which seer and seen no longer manifested. Mm. And this became, of course, uh, a teaching that has spread worldwide of self-inquiry, uh, a very important teaching. Uh, many, many, many Westerners have engaged with this teaching. Uh, and certainly when we were in India back in the day with Ram Das, with Neem Karoli Baba, we were very aware uh, of, of him and his teachings, although they were as I said, this was an, uh, the path of non-dualism versus what we were, uh, the lineage that we came from, which was the path, path of bhakti yoga, but ultimately, of course, going to the exact same place. So my question to you is, David, what were the things that even led you to have any interest whatsoever in any of this? I mean, you grew up in, in England, correct? And um, what happened when you were a youth that uh, prompted you to have any idea that there was something beyond uh, mind and body and uh, ego? I was at university, and for no discernible reason, I started getting very, very interested in Eastern religions, I was, I was quite omnivorous. I wasn't picky. I would just go down to my university bookstore, pick up anything that looked interesting, read it, go back a few days later, pick something else, read it. It, was, it became a kind of addiction, this need to know, this need to find out information. And this went on. I was spending money I didn't have, buying more and more books. And then one day, this book literally dropped into my hands. It fell off the shelf in the bookstore. And I thought, that looks interesting. And it was, it was a book on Ramana Maharshi's teachings, one of the few that existed in the West at that time. I took it home and read it. And un unlike the other books, which had simply precipitated an urge to rush back to the store and buy another book, this book shut me up. I, it, it's very hard to describe exactly what happened it, it, it was just so immensely, deeply satisfying. It put me in the state of silence that the teachings were pointing at. It somehow missed out the middleman, although there were instructions in the book saying this is what you do to achieve this state. Somehow there was a power in the words coming as they did from Ramana himself that touched me in a place that silenced my mind. And although I wasn't framing anything he said against any particular questions or doubts that I had. It, it somehow stopped my questioning mind. It stopped my perverse addiction to rushing out and buying books. I just thought, that's mm -hmm. it. I, I, don't, I don't need to know anything more. There's, there's something about this which is so, so complete that what, whatever questions might arise in future, there's an, there's an answer in this if I ever need an, need an answer, but right now I don't. I'm just quiet, thank you very much. Mm. So that there was something deep, deeply moving about my first contact with the words, because those words put me in a silence, which somehow severed this necessity, this addiction to going out to getting more information. Uh, it, it showed me in a, in a way what it was like to be truly quiet, to have no thoughts, to be peaceful. And I just thought, well, this is the man for me. I stayed with it. Mm. But do you have, did you have at that time any concept of what a guru is whatsoever? I think probably by the time I read this book, I consumed, I don't know, maybe 50, 60, 70 books on similar topics. Some uh -huh. were Buddhist, Taoist, and, and anything you could think of. I'd, I'd had a, a dabble in. So I had quite a good uh -huh. uh, feeling of what was going on. Mm. Um, I won't say I was an expert, but I, I had a good frame of reference when that book fell into my hands. And so, next step, or the eventuality of it, you went off to India as a young man. Tell us about that and getting over to Ramana Asha. Um, I left university. How to explain this? 
I was being compelled by my university to read academic tracts, which really rubbed me up the wrong way. There was, there was something very reductionist about them, the idea that you could dismantle the universe into its smallest components, have a look at them, figure out what their role was in the scheme of things, put them all back together again and understand how the world ticked. That this simply wasn't, to me, an unsatisfactory way of looking at the world. There was a visceral revulsion in me. I just knew, knew this wasn't the way that you approached true knowledge. This was, this was knowledge of things, knowledge of objects, and it was so unappealing to me, I actually developed nausea when I picked up these books and <laughs> tried to read them. So I, I thought, no, I'm, like, I'm, I'm going to look for a different kind of knowledge. So I, I basically dropped out and went off to the west coast of Ireland, rented myself a little cottage in the middle of nowhere. Um, in, in those days, ten, $10 a week for a two-bedroom house and an acre of land. Grew, grew, grew all my own food. Mm. had a really nice... It was a kind of detox from uh, the west. Mm. I just felt I had to be away from the influence of everything which had happened before. I took my Ramana books, I meditated, I did inquiry. And then uh, the owner of my house had been working illegally in Australia and had managed to blow himself up on a building site with no medical insurance and was quite badly injured. Mm. So he, he needed to sell the house I was in. So I took off to Israel. I couldn't fancy, didn't fancy another cold, wet English winter. <laughs> so I took off to live, to live on a kibbutz. This is 75, 76. I, I picked the hottest one that was available, which was on the Dead Sea at Ein Gedi. Very pleasant, very nice. Mm. At, the end, at the end of that winter, I thought, well, I'll probably go back to Ireland, but I've got time on my hands. I've got a bit of cash in my pocket. Maybe I should go to India and check out Raman Ashram before I go back to the West. So I, I did my sums, um, figured out I had to go back to London, how much it would cost, and I realized I was about you know, three, four hundred dollars short. And I thought, well, if, if that money manifests out of nowhere in the next two weeks, I'll go, and if it doesn't, it's not destined to happen. And within a couple of days of that, my grandmother's lawyer, my grandmother was dead, wrote me a letter saying, uh, Dear David, we found some old shares in a box, uh, seven-way split with the grandchildren, your share is dot, 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 and it was exactly the amount of money I, I needed to go, go to India, so I thought, okay, that's a good sign. So I went there, um, I was 23, I arrived here in 1976, fell in love with the place, it felt like home almost immediately, but then there was this I don't want to leave this place, but I haven't got much cash. I just came here for a few weeks, feeling inside me. And I was saving up my return ticket money. And then I, I think I was just standing in front of Ramana Samadhi. And the thought, the thought occurred to me, I, I don't need to go home. I am home. And that was just such a great weight that was lifted off me. And at that, I pronounced and I thought, that's it. I'm staying here. This, this is home. I'm not moving. And that was slightly more than 40 years ago, and I'm still here. <laughs> Unbelievable. Amazing. You know, when I, when I first went to India, which is a little bit before you, a uh, number of years, the first place that I went to was Durvanamalai, a holy place. And, uh, and that was my entrance, basically, into India, and was... Uh, having darshan of uh, Arunachala and uh, Ramana Maharshi Samadhi. And uh, so, yeah, I have always felt a connectivity to it. And, um, and that's actually, David, one of the, a big reason I was glad to be introduced to you because I really wanted to share who he is, who what his teachings were. I think that they're really... Uh, effective for people to uh, to get a perspective to uh, a, a new vantage uh, point on their lives from which to see um, 
their incarnations basically so uh, i'm really happy you know someone like you has steeped himself and immersed himself in these teachings for so long and uh, and you're and you look pretty good and you've managed to live in india for 40 years that's even un- more unbelievable david yeah how did, um, how'd you do that I, 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 I tell people i was genetically modified for india my nose doesn't work <laughs> my stomach is cast iron so <laughs> I, I, I've done okay. Uh, that's so great. Um, well, anyhow, so then you were there, and, and of course, reading up a little bit about uh, your history and so on. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing that happened to you uh, relative to the uh, the ashrams library, which kind of put you on your path in terms of what you've been doing all these years. Talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure it did, but that that was a fun episode. Um, the ashram had. A magazine that was getting uh, quite good books. Uh, it was receiving them to be reviewed, and they were all locked up in one room. And I was feeling an urge to start reading again, catch up on some spiritual literature. But I could never get into this uh, this room. The key was held by a rather grumpy old man who uh, <laughs> said, "Well, tell me what you want, and I'll go and look for it." Uh, so you had to randomly think of a book title that might be in there. And then he would go in there, and there was no system, no classification. He would just go in there for 10 seconds, and if he didn't see it, he'd come out and say it wasn't there. And I thought, this, this is not really a, a sustainable way of getting good books. So I, I volunteered to go in there, look after it, sort it out, make a little library so anyone could use it. And it grew. I got interested in it. I ended up... Uh, building a whole new library for the ashram. I got uh, funds from the central government. I ran it for eight years. Mm. And when I left, and when I left, it was in a, a three-story building, had uh, thousands and thousands of books, and was very, very well patronized. Good, good period of my life. I enjoyed it. Mm. But, but uh, you're, I mean, you've written how many books? Quite a few books around uh Ramana Maharshi? Um, somewhere around 15. It dep- depends where the cutoff is between minor involvement, major involvement, full on writing, but about 15. Yeah, so what, and uh, uh, maybe erroneously said that uh, your work in the library contributed to uh, launching you into uh, a writing career. I took that job because I wanted to have access to good spiritual books. But it, it wasn't in any way uh, research for any project I had. I think, uh, I think the first person who prodded me that way was Nisargadatta. I, I went to see him and uh, apropos almost nothing at all, he just looked at me one day, jabbed his finger and said, you must write about the teachings. And I thought, that's not my job. I, I sit and meditate in an ashram. I, I stamp library books. I don't write about spiritual teachings. I, I just read them and meditate. But somehow, I think he looked at me and decided, well, that's, that's his destiny in life. Uh, but I didn't do anything about it. I think it was years before I started writing after that. Hmm. Um, and I want to, uh, a, a little later here in our conversation talk about Nizar Gadatta because he's an important figure uh, as well but um, just in, so yeah obviously you steeped yourself in these teachings in a major way and I, I think it'd be great for people who are listening who don't know much about Ramana's teachings and I, I'd like to just point out some of the real effective ways that people can use them I think would be would be a great thing there there's one uh, I don't not sure if uh, hopefully you might remember this story but it's an analogy around an ego and it's uh, I, I believe it's uh, Ramana Maharshi telling the story of a Hindu it's a Hindu marriage story does does that, mm-hmm. does that prompt you where the stranger right. is mistaken for the best man. Can you tell that story? It's a it's a great ego in the analogy. I it, mean, it's a wonderful. This was um, an analogy of um, how how the mind works and causes you problems. He he said in a marriage, generally half the people don't know the other half. So if a stranger walks in and starts misbehaving, 
he gets tolerated because one side assumes he's with the other half yeah. and the other half assumes he's with the first half and because it's a marriage and no one wants to fight, he, he's allowed to uh, uh, do whatever he likes. But if anybody gets tired of his antics and goes up to him and says, exactly who are you, which, which party do you belong to? Uh, then he has to admit that he doesn't belong to either party because everybody is there and he has to run away, he has to make himself scarce. So this, this was Bhagavan's analogy for self-inquiry. He, he said, you have this I inside yourself, which is creating endless suffering for you. Uh, and it only does so because you never look at it and say, who, who exactly are you? Which party do you belong to, in effect? What, what, what business do you have being in this body, pretending that you live here? And he, he said this whole process of scrutinizing this thing inside you, which you call I, is the secret to ending this mischief of the individual I by transcending the idea that there is an I there in the first place. Mm. I love that. Mischief of the individual right. I. <laughs> That's a great phrase. Um, and uh, and there's a, you know let's just talk a little bit about in terms of the real uh, practice here and the teachings and and the in, the application of them i mean there is for instance there are many people who think meditation is about uh you know i i have to stop my thoughts and uh re basically reject them one way or the other because as long as those thoughts keep coming i'm going to be suffering and so on now, of course, there is truth to that, uh, but uh, talk about uh, Ramana Maharshi's, uh, what he talked about in relation to thoughts and, and the rejection of thoughts. He did not belong to the suppression of thoughts uh, branch. He, uh, he said you don't get rid of the mind or the eye by indulging in your desires or trying to suppress them. He said, neither, neither is an effective way of controlling. Let me just give a little background on, on how he saw the nature of the mind and the eye, because that understanding is central to his solution to the problem. He, he said that your sense of being an individual person, of being an eye occupying a body, can only exist in association with an identification or an objective, an objectifying of looking at something, thinking of something, perceiving something, remembering something. So there's always an internal I who latches onto something, a memory, a thought, a perception, an idea, and says, I am thinking this, I am perceiving this, or I am angry. And he said that process of connecting is the only thing that makes this I persist. He said, I by itself has no capacity to exist as an entity. It, almost, it must always be in association with something else. So he said the trick to getting rid of the I is to stop it reaching out to connect and identify with anything other than itself. So this process of self-inquiry, for which he's quite famous, is simply being aware of what it is inside yourself that thinks your thoughts when you say, I see a tree, or I believe this, or I am angry. There is an I inside yourself that has taken possession of this thought, this process, and said, I am doing this, I am believing this. So he said, take attention off the object that your mind is looking at, playing with, experiencing, and instead simply be aware of what it is inside yourself that thinks the thoughts, perceives the perceptions, and every time the mind says, hey, over here, go, go and play with this thought, that thought, this experience, this memory, just say, no, thank you, and go back to this central coordinating I inside yourself. And he said, if you can withstand the temptation to extrovert to any idea or thought or perception, then this I cannot exist in isolation. It has to sink back in its source and disappear, at which point you find out what you really are, when the eye is absent. Mm. Just as you were saying that, I was thinking of the Tibetan, or the Buddhist uh, teaching of dependent origination, mm. where you know, everything 
that uh, you're just reacting to phenomena that is coming at you from what you see, uh-huh. what you feel, what you think. That, uh-huh. uh, but at the uh, core of it, you are completely, as they call, Buddha mind. You are, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. So So I think what's a little bit different about Bhagavan's method, he's not asking people to watch thoughts, um, be an observer of any kind. Uh, He said, if you put your attention on something, you can call that meditation. If you put attention on the eye, which sees these things, that's inquiry. That's what he used to differentiate his method from most other methods. He said, be aware of yourself as I and don't let any other thoughts intrude. And if they do, just say, I am perceiving that thought, and go back to this I. So it's subjective attention to your own individual identity, to what it is inside yourself that claims ownership of your thoughts. It's not watching them, it's not stopping them, it's not indulging them. It's simply a transfer of attention from the object you think about to the thinker of them. Talking about that and thinking of that in terms of of how popular mindfulness, quote unquote, is in the West mm-hmm. now, it's interesting to uh, to perceive these teachings within that general the general idea of mindfulness because there is obviously mindfulness involved here when you are just even shifting perception, which is what it's a tra- it's a transfer of attention to object from objects that float in your, in your consciousness to what it is that's registering them. That's, that's all mm-hmm. it is. It's a one-step process. No, I'm not going to dwell on that object. I'm going to be aware of myself as subject. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting that he, he would talk a lot about is um, renunciation and the uh, complete... He was not for renunciation, correct? He went against tradition in so far as he didn't ever give anybody permission to take sannyas. Uh, he never become a monk. Allowed, he never allowed anyone who had worldly responsibilities, a family or a job to give them up. He, he said, wherever you go, you have to take your mind with you. You can't run away from the mind. If your destiny is to be a householder with a job, then stay, stay with that. Look after your family, do your job. But in all your spare time, Try to be aware of what it is that's thinking your thoughts. He said, don't come to me and say, I'm too busy. I've got this problem, that problem. He said, everybody in their life has free time in the bathroom, walking to work, shopping. Just stop your mind running all over the place in whatever free time you have. Focus it on this I. And he said, if you can do that, you will create a zone of peace, silence inside yourself in your spare time, and then when you have to jump back into the fray with your angry boss or your screaming kids, then you're functioning from this zone of silence, this zone of peace that you've created in your spare time. Mm. So he wasn't saying, reject all that, run away, hide in a cave. He was saying, do your job, whatever it is, and whatever spare time you have, focus it on this eye and create your peace in your spare time, and then it will pervade the rest of your life. Mm. And I think it'd be good. One last thing uh, would be good to really make clear about the I that we're talking about. I mean, the I that all of most of us, ninety-nine point nine percent of us, relate to, is that I that we develop as uh, after birth. That is absolutely related to I, me, mine, I, me, mine, oh. I, me, mine. That is the ultimate I that uh, Ramana Maharshi was talking about was, uh, in, in my understanding, the I that is the core um, pure manifestation of consciousness that we are. Correct. correct? Yeah. Okay. The first teaching, or one of the first teachings he ever gave, was to a man called Siva Prakasan Pillai, who came to see him when he was maybe 21. He wasn't speaking. And Siva Prakasan Pillai asked the one question probably that interested Ramana the most. He walked in and said, who am I? And Ramana simply wrote with his finger in the sand, 
Haribu Nan, consciousness is I. And I think every, every, everything after that was an elaboration of that one simple statement he made to one of his first devotees about 1900. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Then um, we, you mentioned Nizar Gardata Maharaj uh, ah. earlier, and you did spend time with him, and uh, I've read a lot about him, and he uh, is a bit of a favorite also in the West of a non-dual practice uh, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about your meeting with him and what, what was he like? Um, I went there um, maybe 1978 for the first time with very good feelings about him. I'd read I Am That. The, the words had touched me in the same way that Brahmana's words had touched me a few years earlier. The vocabulary was different. Some of the ideas I found a little bit oddly expressed, but that there was a power in those words that compelled me to go and see him. And what, what I liked about him was that you couldn't hide. Um, he had a very small room and if you, it was an upstairs mezzanine floor. If you walked up the stairs, he would see you, he would call you in, sit you down in front of in front of him. Who are you? What do you want? Why have you come here? And he, how to explain this? He wanted you to give him a construct, if you like. He wanted you to tell him what your practice was, who your teacher teachers were, what you'd read, who you thought you were, where you thought you were going. So he, he would draw you out and he would make you talk about this. But simultaneously, he'd be glaring at you and actually giving you a transmission of who you really were. So on the one hand, you would be building this little fantasy world made of your own concepts, trying to explain who you were and why you'd come and where you were going. While simultaneously, he was giving you the true experience of what was underneath it all. And at some point, if you got what was going on, you would stop because the experience he was giving you was so um, not powerful. It, it, it refuted and made a nonsense of all the things you were trying to explain to him. He, he made you realize that whatever you said about yourself had to be wrong because the experience he was giving you in that moment showed you who you really were and all these concepts you were piling one on top of the other couldn't possibly be true because they didn't relate to this substratum he was showing to you. He was very, very good at that. Mm. Um, but in a very feisty, argumentative, oh, rash yeah. <laughs> way, um, not a saintly man. Um, <laughs> well, in, the, uh, in maybe in the definition that we have of quote-unquote uh, saint, like... Uh, right. Yeah. No, I mean, his, de his default mode was feistiness. I mean, that... On, on a good day, he would just be feisty, and sometimes he'd get really angry. He, he, he very rarely seemed in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I remember one, uh, one, one American woman very innocently saying, he, she said, Maharaj, I've read all the books, and it says there that being enlightened makes you very peaceful and happy. What you happened to you? Very, you don't seem very peaceful and happy. You're, <laughs> shouting, you're shouting all the time. <laughs> and uh, he, 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 he said... The only, the only time that I'm really peaceful and happy is when somebody gets it. Mm. And he said, that's so rare, my default mode is feistiness and shouting because you're not getting it. <laughs> mm. yeah. Amazing. A lot of Westerners came through there too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he was, he was uh, a bit of a mecca for the, the who's who of a, a whole generation of Western teachers. They all touched base with him in Mumbai. Mm. Who were some of them, actually? Um, Walter Kears was quite a famous Vedanta Advaita teacher. Hmm. I think Christopher Titmus was there. You know, the, I think Joseph Goldstein was there. They all kind of went and had a look. He was famous. He was. Um, no, I didn't know Joseph was there too. Wow. The uh, all sorts of people were there. I remember the uh, the Times of London. The, pr the printers went on strike for a year and the owners told all their journalists to go off and write a book for a year. They kept them on full pay 
And mm. I remember Bernard Levin, who was the star commentator of the Times, turning up with some Hollywood movie star. I mean, he was just he was just the place to go. Just everybody had heard of him, and everybody went up and had a look at him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And there is something from you all from England. I mean, because uh, there was a, a, a couple of noteworthy people. Uh, Osborne was one of them who came and met uh, Ramana. And who else? There was some... Um, from Britain? Yeah. Um, Paul, Brunt, Paul Brunton. Paul Brunton. In the 1930s, he mm. wrote... He, he put Ramana on the map. He wrote The Search in Secret India, right. which was the best-selling book of the 30s. He was interested in people with um, supernatural powers primarily, but I, I think of all the people he met, it's quite clear that Ramanit impressed him the most, and he makes this quite clear in his book. And when that book came out, I think for probably 20 years, that was the primary source, the first book that people read, and that's the reason they went to see Ramanit, because they'd read Brunton's book. Mm. And, and then in, in the in the fifties, Osborne wrote or edited three new books, and for the next twenty years or so, he was the the primary point of access for people who wanted to find out about Bhagavan. Well, and then your book, right? Be as you are. Everybody. And then uh, mine came out in the eighties, and then probably for twenty years, I think most people in the West that was their first book. Um, Largely because Raman Ashram's own books are not well distributed outside India. And Penguin, who did BIUR, had an extraordinary uh, distribution system so that just about every spiritual bookstore in the world was stopping it. Yeah. So I, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it was any better than anybody else's book, but I had, I had the wind behind me with Penguin. Mm. I, uh, I, I was with my dad. My dad wasn't very happy with my life choices. <laughs> And he, 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 he came to India in the early 90s. Um, he was in one of these hole-in-the-wall boutiques in Pondicherry looking for presents to take home, and I was just at the entrance trying to get a free, free read of Newsweek or Time while he did his shopping. And then I noticed this place had four books on display. One of them was John Grisham, another was Delia Smith, a best-selling cookery. But it's basically it was three international best-selling authors plus be as you are <laughs> so I, I, I called my dad up from the back of the store and said look look what kind of company i'm keeping and he said did you put that book there did you put that book there and i said no no ask, ask the owner he's selling four books in the shop and one of them is mine mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I think his opinion of me went up a little bit yes that's not, good. Much, not much just a little bit <laughs> There's a funny story too about penguin, right? In the terms, uh, I can't quite remember what it was, but you went. Was it about um, getting the book re uh, a new edition or something? And they looked at you and said, "What are you talking about?" Tell that's funny that story. Oh, you've been you've been reading well. Um, I think about um, sixteen, seventeen years ago, uh, I was looking for an Indian publisher for three books I had written on Papaji in the 1990s. It, it had only been published in the US, and I thought Penguin might be interested in doing an Indian version since they were selling my book and selling lots of copies. So I made an, I made an appointment with the, the commissioning editor of Penguin in Delhi and walked in. And she said, no, we've never heard of you. <laughs> who are you? Who are you? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean, who are you? <laughs> I'm I, the ed editor of one of your best-selling books. No, you're not. <laughs> it's not It's not in our catalog. And I said, well, look on your computer. She said, I've looked on the computer. You're not there. And I said, well, I, I gave the copyright away to Raman Ashram. I said, well, go check your accounts department. They're sending checks to Raman Ashram, you know, why are you sending money to Raman Ashram if the book doesn't exist? And she just doubled down. She just dug, it, dug in her heels and said my book didn't exist. And then I, I left the office and I thought, well, I don't really want to deal with a publisher who denies that one of their own best-selling titles doesn't exist, especially, <laughs> when, it, especially when it's my book. <laughs> so at that point, I made a decision to start publishing my own books. Mm. I thought at least... At least uh, 
you know I can keep some control over them that yeah. way so from from that point on I've always done my own mm. yeah that's great though and then uh, I just thought this can't be true it can't be true it must be there somewhere so I, I went to their site and they had a special offer <laughs> of all their best-selling books, anything which had sold more than 10,000 copies, that's just in India. Hmm. If you bought four books, then you didn't pay for the cheapest of the four. And my book was on that list. There was, <laughs> there was only about 25 books that made the list, and mine was one of them. But when I went to the office, you know, I basically got thrown out. They disowned me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good prompt to start my own uh, printing activities. Yeah. I, I have never regretted that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Penguin. Yeah. Um, so uh, th there was a, a couple of people that you became close to um, that uh, I found fascinating. Uh, th one in particular uh, was um, a woman saint named Shardama. Shardama. Mm -hmm. huh? Shardama. Yeah, Shardama. Oh, sure. Shardama. Shardama. <laughs> yeah, and... Oh. Um, yeah, tell me uh, about her, that, that, uh, what's her story? And I, had, you know, I pride myself, I've been going to India since the, the you know, for many, many decades, uh, on okay. a regular basis and have met many, many, many saints and so on, teachers. I'd never heard of her and I was, a sh the picture that I saw on your site of her, uh, mm. reminded me of Ananda Maima. Uh, mm. She yep. was just yep. just beautiful. Some of, some of some of the young photos look a bit like a Nanda Maima. Yeah, yeah. So if if we re rewind the story a little bit, um, her guru is a man called Lakshmanaswamy, who is still alive in his early nineties. Oh, really? And he was a direct disciple of Ramana Maharshi, and he realized himself sitting in Ramana's presence late in 1949. So he is probably in my opinion, is probably the last of the last of the last. He's the one person still alive on planet Earth who went to see Ramana, did self-inquiry in Ramana's presence, and got the full definitive experience of the self. So he went back to his village in Andhra Pradesh, lived a very reclusive hermit's life for about 25 years, and he had a, a knowledge or some kind of prevision that this girl was going to come and be his devotee, but he had no idea where she was or when she was going to come. And she didn't show up until the mid-1970s. And hers was a classic uh, devotional path. She fell in love with him. She started chanting his name, looking at his picture all day. He Real bhakti. Had come to he had come from a background of self-inquiry with Bhagavan. He was, he was always trying to make her do inquiry and she had zero interest in it. Um, she, all, she, all she wanted to do was hold on to the name and form of her guru. And she did it extraordinarily well. Um, I talked to her about all this and she said at the peak of her passion, if you like, she was, med she was meditating on his form or chanting his name 20 hours a day. And in the, in the four hours she was asleep, she said, I was dreaming of him all night. So it was 24-7. And Lakshmana Swami told me that the energy that was coming off her was so intense, he didn't sleep for three years. Wow. She, she would have this huge, these huge waves of bhakti coming off her towards him. And he said, if I was lying in bed asleep, the, the intensity of that wave would wake me up in the middle of the night. And he said, I, w I went to her and I said, just give me a break, really. You know, I, 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 need, my, I need my sleep. Just don't, don't do this at night and we'll both get a good night's sleep. And she said, I, I can't help it. It's continuous. It's not under my control. It's there all the time. So he told me he couldn't sleep while she was doing this. It was so strong. She said she couldn't stop it. And then a point came when this devotion simply burned out all of her thought she could no longer chant the name, she could no longer focus on the picture. And she went into a kind of samadhi, thought-free state. Um, it, it wasn't the destruction of the mind, it was simply a state in which she no longer had any capacity to activate the mind. 
And there was a, a climactic moment in 1978 when she sat with Lakshmanaswamy and he knew this is it, this is this is the day it's going to happen. So he actually ran a tape recorder. So I, I, I listened to that with him. And she really does sound like she's enlightened. But Lakshmanaswamy said, no, no, she's not. She, she was having temporary experiences. Uh, and she said it felt as if her, I thought, was physically crashing around inside her skull. It was so panicked. It somehow knew in advance it was about to die. It was, it was, it's like you know, playing ping, playing not ping pong. What's this? Um, Tennis. Where you, where, where you hit the flippers and the ball goes round and round. Pinball. Oh, pinball. pinball. So it was like, it, like pinball running around in her head, sort of crashing off different angles of the inside of her skull. Mm. And she went up and took Swami's hands and put them on her head, and that calmed it down for a bit. But then it would come back. And she said, finally, I went up and put my head on his feet, at which point the eye stopped, it went back to its source, it died and it never came back again. So that, that was her liberation. Um, she's still alive, he's still alive, they both live in Tirumanamale. Really? That's the good news. The bad, the bad news is he's a complete recluse. Um, he hasn't seen anybody since maybe 2008. He used to give two or three public darshans a year. She's theoretically accessible, but getting harder and harder to see. She has no public engagements. You have to go to her gate, um, send in a note saying who you are and why you want to see her. And probably 19 out of 20 people don't get a reply, or if they do, it's no. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite frustrating that these incredible beings are there behind a large gate, and nobody can get near them at the moment. Hmm. You, though? Have you, do you get together? I, I hit lucky on this. I went up there uh, before they came to Tiruvannamalai. Uh, he lived in southern Andhra Pradesh. He had a little place there. I went up there because, I must tell you this, backtrack a little bit. He had come to Ramanashram in 1978. And a friend of mine said, go, go and see this man. He's supposed to be an enlightened disciple of Ramana. And I thought, well, why not? Kind of sounds interesting, but I, I had no feelings one way or the other that he was or he wasn't, and I wasn't going there with any feeling that uh, I was checking him out or testing him. I sat down and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and the first thought that came into my head was, "This is a nyani." I don't know where that thought came from. It was instant. To explain. Ex Explain that. And jnani is some, somebody who has realized the self, who abides as jnana, as knowledge, as knowing the self permanently at all times. So I just looked at him and I thought, this man is in that state. And he just looked at me very steadily, nonstop, for about probably 30 minutes, which was pretty intense. But probably within the first five seconds, I was more quiet, more peaceful more everything that you want from your meditation than I'd ever got from sitting eight hours a day, which is what I'd been doing at that time for a year and a half. And I thought, I, th I thought I was getting somewhere. I thought, you know, I'd, I'd started at point A and traveled a long way down a particular road to point B. But I, I realized from having this man look at me that my estimation of how far I'd gone and how far I had to go was ridiculously uh, uh, out of joint with reality and I thought this 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 is what you need you need somebody who is in this state who has the power to show it to you merely by looking at you mm. so that, that for me was a kind of uh, tipping point so from that point on I sought and was lucky enough to find people in this tradition who had this capacity to simply show you who you are by just being in their presence, by looking at you. Uh, Nisargadatta was one, he was one, later on Saradam was one. Um, good fortune. I've, I've met a few and they all had this same mm. innate power that by abiding as that, as that self, by being that self, that consciousness, somehow in their proximity, your mind naturally quietens down and you share, however briefly, 
that state that they permanently dwell as. Hmm. I completely commiserate with you. In my own experience, I feel so... Eh? Uh, commiserate's not the right word, is it? I'm, a, I'm at one with you on that point. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, in a feeling, you know, tremendous uh, blessing of, of being able to, and that's what you're describing is exactly what happened sitting with Neem Karoli Bob. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and also Ananda Maima was another one, mm-hmm. and mother of uh, Sri Aurobindo Ashram. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there, it, it's extremely fortunate uh, to for us, you and I, and mm-hmm. different, uh, with different beings, but basically... It is only there is only one thing going on, and uh, right. and that's exactly. what gets transmitted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, before we we have to stop, um, I am a big lover of animals, David. Of what? Animals. I animals, love right. animals. You could okay. hear my dogs barking during this podcast uh-huh. a little bit, uh, and. I, of course, knew this story before, but I was refreshed by it after looking through your site and some of the material. Uh, but you must tell the story of Lakshmi the cow <laughs> and Ramana. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? You want the five-minute oh, no. version? Oh, yeah, no. Whatever. It's all good. Um, Lakshmi the cow was... Uh, a cow who lived at Raman Ashram for about 20 years from 19, maybe 1928 till she passed away there, 1948. She was not Bhagavan's pet. She was Bhagavan's devotee in every real sense of the word. She arrived uh, as the calf of a cow which had been donated to Raman Ashram. Uh, Bhagavan originally didn't want to keep the cow because he thought it would be too much trouble to look after it. And then one of his saver minded devotees, Ramanatha Brahmachari, said, I'll look after it, I'll look after it. And on, on that condition, Bhagavan allowed it to stay. But she developed into a truly outstanding devotee. Uh, and everybody knew that she was not how do we say, not to be treated as an animal. She was treated as a devotee throughout her whole life. Mm. She had the freedom to walk into Bhagavan's hall at any time of the day. Uh, She would sit there along with everybody else. And she seemed to like human, Indian human food better than the grass that she was being fed. Uh, That that, that There was a, a popular belief which Bhagavan never openly endorsed that she was the reincarnation of a woman who fed him on Arunachala in, mm. in his early years there, called Kirai Patti. Kirai is Tamil for green leaves, and Patti means grandmother. So she was a lady who used to go around picking leaves, cooking them, and serving them to Bhagavan. She passed away in the early 1920s, and Bhagavan all but admitted that this was Kirai Patti come back for her last life in the body and form of a cow. There, there are just so many extraordinary stories about her. Um, before she moved to Raman Ashram, uh, she was kept in a cow shed in town, and she had to go back there in the evening to be stabled. And she knew when her curfew time was. It's like she, she would come into the hall, uh, 7.30, the din- dinner. There was no dinner bell in those days. And Bhagavan would look at the clock and say, oh, yes, it's 7.30. Lakshmi's come to do her pranams before she goes home. <laughs> so she would, walk back, she would walk back to town, spend the night there, and then come back again. And she got so distressed at having to leave the ashram, apparently occasionally she'd have tears running down her face at the thought of having to go home. And in the end, they built a cow shed for her in the ashram. And that's another amazing story in that Bhagavan was extraordinarily frugal. He really hated waste. And apropos nothing at all, he commissioned this gigantic cow shed, which when it was built was the biggest building in the ashram. It was about four times bigger than the hall that he sat in to see his devotees. And everybody 
was upset at all the money it was consuming, but he pushed ahead with this plan. And he went on the record of, of saying, if we build this huge cow shed for Lakshmi, we will accumulate all the punyas, the spiritual brownie points, if you like, that will enab enable us to develop the whole of the rest of the ashram. So he really thought that serving Lakshmi and making her a palatial building would have such good positive results that the ashram would be able to develop and build all its other buildings as well. And that, that's what proved to be true. Mm. He had an amazing bond with her. Uh, they talked to each other in whatever language, non-verbal, of course, but she would come in and say what she wanted and Bhagavan would immediately understand. And it wasn't simple things like, um, you know, where's my grass? She, she, would, she would come with quite complicated ideas. My favorite story was told by uh, um, a woman who said she walked in one morning and Bhagavan looked at her and there was some unspoken communication. And then he turned to his attendant and said, Lakshmi wants to know where her idli idlis are. She hasn't received her idlis this morning. So rice, it's rice cakes, these, everybody. These rice cakes that they used to serve in the ashram dining room. And apparently that something had gone wrong that morning and they hadn't made enough. And so Lakshmi hadn't been given her usual plate of idlis. So she'd walked into the hall and demanded of Bhagavan where her, where her plate of idlis was that morning. And Bhagavan said, well, are, are there any left? And somebody said, well, so-and-so has gone shopping to town. We saved, we saved some for him. And he said, okay, we'll split them up, give her half. And the other man can have two when he comes back. Mm -hmm. And she kind of, he, he personally fed her the idlis and she went away happy. So he, he had this ability to communicate with her. She could come and express her thoughts. Uh, she was always allowed in there. Nobody was allowed to chase her out. Of course, you know, she'd come and poop on the floor. She was a big, <laughs> large, solid animal, and it was a small space. But uh, she, she had right of way. And there, there's one story. Um, she was sitting there one day. Bhagavan was looking at her, and he, he said, do you know what state she's in right now? And of course, nobody had any idea. He just said, she's in Samadhi. She's sitting in Samadhi. So he, for a long time, she was a very advanced devotee who caught Bhagavan by the strength of her devotion, the strength of her unconditional love and surrender. And when she passed away in 1948, he went to the cow shed uh, and spent about maybe half an hour with her, kind of stroking her head and putting one hand on the heart center, which is what, what he did a few times in his life to help liberate some of his advanced devotees. And in her case, the business was done before she died. I think he, he knew that she was in that final state before she passed away. And he said, Mother, I've got to go. People are waiting for me in the hall. You'll be all right now. And uh, she, she passed away a few minutes after that. But mm. I know that Bhagavan would not have left her if he hadn't been absolutely convinced that she was in this substratum state of consciousness that is all, all there really is. So he knew it. And then the next day she was buried inside Ramanashram. And Bhagavan wrote a poem commemorating the event. It listed all the days, weeks, months in the Tamil calendar and said, on that date, Lakshmi attained liberation. And somebody said, is that just a polite euphemism? Or did she really attain liberation? He said, no, no, it's true liberation. She's a liberated being. Mm. Mm. So much love, compassion, and kindness. And um, but Bhagavan, I think, unlike the Buddhists, Bhagavan didn't maintain that you had to have a human body for your final mm incarnation. Um, he, he was asked about this before Lakshmi had her final liberation. And he said, yes, yes, animals can get liberated. And he said, e e even plants, he said, there's no, there's no restriction. Mm. All, of, all of these things have jivas. And if a mature jiva goes into the right form, then in the proximity of a strong, powerful guru, that, that jiva can be mm -hmm. extinguished by the power of the guru. Yeah, jiva soul for everybody. Jiva is the individual soul. Individual yeah. soul, yeah. That's so wonderful, David. I love mm -hmm. that. 
And for those of you who who maybe do know about Ramana Maharshi uh, and have read any any of his books by anybody and get a feeling like this is um, that Advait teachings that he taught were not um, were devoid of 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 love, compassion, and kindness. His very being emitted that. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I get from from when I read these books, yeah. and and um, actually Ramdas narrated a uh-huh. wonderful film about him using footage. Uh, I don't know who engaged that, but it's he, a really wonderful piece. Actually, he, uh, um, he he was extraordinary in many respects. But one one thing that most people don't appreciate is just how accessible he was. From probably the mid 1920s until early 1940s, he lived in a hall whose doors were never closed. I mean, can you can you imagine that mm. with any teacher nowadays? But mm. if you wanted to see if you wanted to see him at three o'clock in the morning, you could walk in, and he 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 would somehow know you were coming. He'd open his eyes and he'd deal with you. There was never a time when he was off duty, except when he was in the bathroom. So he <laughs> deduct, deduct the number of bathroom trips and the rest of the time he was in public, sitting on a sofa, available to absolutely anybody who wanted to see him. And it didn't matter what hour of the day or night you needed help or wanted to see him. You could walk in and sit there. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is what these beings are about is nothing but mm-hmm. service to, mm-hmm. to humanity. I, I don't think, no, let me elaborate on this a little bit. I, he never thought that anybody else needed his help. He, he said once that anyone who thinks that they've got something to give to the world that will benefit the world, or if, any, if there's anybody who sees somebody who's ignorant, who needs knowledge, then they have no business being a teacher. He, he said the only perspective from which you can give any help is the absolute knowledge that nothing is different from yourself Mm. that nothing needs to be nothing needs to be changed everything is fine just the way it is and if you abide in consciousness as that state then automatically naturally the help will flow from you but it's not from any desire there's no right there's no intention to improve people enlighten people do anything to them you simply know yourself to be self, and by that, by abiding in that knowledge, he, do, you, do you know the word sanity? Is that familiar to you? Sanity is a Sanskrit Tamil word. It mm. means presence. Mm-mm. So the way, the way he explained it is that I do nothing. I, I am simply the self. I am Brahman. But mm. by being that state, an energy field is created around me, and that when people come into my presence, with a desire, or they want something spiritual, then it's the sanity that attends to it. I do presence, nothing yeah. except, except be the self. But this presence, this field, is what responds to all the people who come with their doubts, their questions, their desires. He said it, it, this sanity can even grant liberation if people come in the right state. But mm. it's nothing to do with me, because I don't see anything as different from myself I don't see suffering people, I don't see unenlightened people, but by being in that state, this energy field is created which takes care of all the people who come into it. Mm. Gee, it's uh, our our word, that word of course sounds very much like sanity, right? Our sanity. S-A-N-N-I-D-H-I, it's it's kind of like sanity. Yeah, Uh, I'm writing it down. but uh, yeah, isn't that uh, you could take our sanity word and say well, ultimate exactly. sanity yeah. is ultimate mm-hmm. sanadi, right. ultimate presence. So great to have you uh, on on mind rolling, David. I'm really happy Thanks. we got hooked up. Uh, this is just um, uh, something I think really important for people to uh, be able to connect with uh, Bhagavan Ram- Ramana Maharshi. So I thank you for being here. And um, we are, um, if uh, I th- uh, your website, so people can get a little bit of a handle and share. What is the uh, URL for it? Um, 
David Godman, all one word, dot O-R-G. Okay, there you go. So uh, <laughs> please take advantage. We'll put that up on the show notes alongside of uh, some of the books. Um, if, if people want to find out more, can I, can I direct them to a YouTube channel instead? Absolutely. Uh, so about three years ago, I got talked into um, giving a whole series of talks about Ramana Maharshi, all the places mm. he lived, stayed, all the devotees who came, what their stories were. And it kind of went on for a while. And in the end, I made about, well, I know exactly, 27 different films, all about Ramana's teachings, his devotees, about Aranachala, about self-inquiry, all the places he lived, all the stories. It all, ca- it all came out. It's all there. And there's lots of lovely old mm. photos of Ramana, old films of him. Mm. It was edited by a friend of mine who did a really good job. So if, if people want something really simple and accessible, go, go there. What is the... Find some, uh, it's just a YouTube, David Godman channel. If you type in David Godman channel on YouTube, you'll, you'll find uh, a playlist of 27 videos uh, of me talking about okay, two or yeah. three years ago. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. So that story, for example, the Lakshmana Swami... I told you about the man who got realized with Bhagavan. There's a whole film about him. Oh. There's, a, there's, other, there's other film, other talks about other people who got liberated through Bhagavan. And just relatively unknown devotees who I really, really like because they kept out of the limelight. Just were very humble, very devout, mm. very surrendered in their own way. Never got to appear in many books, but I, I, I love them for their, their, their humbleness in a way. Mm. Great. Well, thank you again, David. This is uh, Mind Rolling on BeHereNowNetwork.com. And uh, uh, as again, I we will put all of this information up on the page when the podcast is up, and you'll be able to link up to it all and uh, immerse yourself in some of these teachings, which are very powerful. So thank you again, David Godman. It was a pleasure. I, I really enjoy talking about my teachers. It makes makes me happy to think of them, remember them. Wonderful. Yeah. I don't need any I don't need any excuse to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well let's we'll do it again sometime in okay. the future. See you next week, everybody. <laughs>